Um, I'm very happy to welcome you here. Um, I'm actually giving a very short introduction because my colleague, Dr. Allison Holman, will be introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Pamela Mitchell. But I wanted to just very briefly introduce you to Dr. Holman and how this speaker series got off the ground. So Dr. Allison Holman is my very close colleague in the program in nursing science. She's an assistant professor and has done lots of research on um, indirect exposure to traumatic events af after very stressful events such as 9-11 or hurricanes, um, various kinds of stressful events. Um, and that's her research. What she is currently doing in relation to this research is that she's a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation nurse faculty scholar. And this is a huge honor. She was one of 12 people selected for this across the country. It's a three-year program. She's in her third year now. And as um, part of that, she, is, she gets some funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to support the research she's doing, but she also has a very strong passion for clinical translational science, translational research. So some of the funding that she is getting from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is going to support this lecture series that she has developed. And Dr. Mitchell is actually the third of, in our series of speakers, we have had Dr. Um, Patricia Grady, who is the director of the National um, Institute for Nursing Research here. And then we also had uh, Dr. Brenda Zierler, who's also from Pam's institution, the University of Washington. Um, and Brenda Zierler was here a few months ago. And Allison, of course, will introduce you to Pam Mitchell. Um, this, this lecture is also being video streamed to UCLA, and we're very happy that we could do this and to collaborate with our um, sister school in Southern California. And I'm just very grateful to Dr. Holman for the hard work that she has put into this lecture series and for promoting clinical translational research, which is very important to this campus. Allison. Thank you, Ellen, for the very nice and uh, introduction. So good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank you for coming to this talk. It is my great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Pamela Mitchell to you. Dr. Mitchell is the interim dean of the School of Nursing and, and professor of biobehavioral nursing and health systems, adjunct professor in the Department of Health Services, and the founding director of the Center for Health Sciences Interprofessional Education and research at the University of Washington. Talk about having a lot on your plate. <laughs> She's also the co-director for the Research Education Core in the Institute for Translational Health Sciences at the university as well. She received her bachelor's degree in nursing from University of Washington, a master's degree in nursing science uh, in medical surgical nursing from the University of California, San Francisco, and then she returned to University of Washington to do a PhD in healthcare systems ecology. She has co-authored and authored or co-authored more than 200 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, abstracts, or reports. She has had a very rewarding career in clinical translational research and has been honored with several major awards. One most recently, she was given the Catherine A. Lembright Award, which recognizes and encourages excellence in cardiovascular research by established nurse scientists. It is named in honor of the American Heart Association's Assistant Director for Nursing from 1960 to 1981, who played an important role in the development and growth of the Council on Cardiovascular Aging. As awarded recipient, Dr. Mitchell gave an honorary lecture at the American Heart Association Conference last fall entitled, Broken Hearts, Broken Brains, and the Blues. In this lecture, she explored current theories about why depression might be so uh, so much more prevalent in the acute and chronic cardiac disease uh, population with people with cardiac disease and stroke, and how genes might interact and what practitioners might be able to do to imp improve the quality of care for patients who suffer from these disorders. 
In 2011, she was honored with the Ada Sue Hinshaw Award at the friend, at, by the Friends of the National Institute for Nursing Research, which is presented to nurse scientists who make a major contribution to improving health care through their research. In 2010, she was awarded the Sigma Theta Tau International uh, Award as inaugural member for the Nurse Research Hall of Fame. Clearly, and that's just the last three of the awards she's received recently. There have been plenty of others. But if that isn't busy enough, she's also served on several national commissions and boards of many professional organizations. She's been a member of, she's currently a member of the American Academy of Nursing Expert Panel on Quality Health Care, a fellow of the American Heart Association and Stroke Council. She's also co-director of the Nurse Scientist Special Interest Group for the NIH CTSA Consortium. She was president of the American Academy of Nursing from 2007 to 2009. She served on the editorial boards. I don't know how this woman does this, but she does. And you're going to hear a remarkable story about her work very shortly. Her research interest is in improving care for patients with such conditions as stroke, heart attack, hypertension, and neurological diseases. She's known throughout the nursing community as being the mother of current practices in nursing care for patients with increased intracranial pressure, such as those with heavy head injury and stroke. She's a recognized leader in nursing, in research, in re managing recovery from brain injury in both acute and community care settings. In sum, Dr. Mil Mitchell is a walking wealth of knowledge and experience to share with us. So without any further delay, I am pleased to introduce to you Dr. Pamela Mitchell from the University of Washington. Thank you, Allison. Oh, yes. Is this OK for the sound? Thank you very much. That was. My goodness, <laughs> that was a lovely introduction. One of the things that keeps me going is an occasional chance to come in a place where the sun shines all day as opposed to sun breaks. So <laughs> this is particularly, given the weather we've had in Seattle the last few weeks, this is really a joy to, uh, you may think it's cold, but it's balmy to me. It's really my pleasure to be here and uh, to have an opportunity to share with you uh, some of the work that we've been doing in, in our CTSA and also in uh, the team, the interdisciplinary team that I uh, co-lead with respect to recovery from uh, stroke. So what I'm going to do over the course of the next hour is to talk um, about the, the uh, evolving um, definitions of uh, translational research because uh, if you ask five people, uh, from around the country what translational research is, you'll get five different answers. Um, and then talk about the varying perspectives of people from different disciplines, illustrating with the, uh, the uh, recovery from stroke program that we've been developing uh, at the UW over the last few years. And then finally, uh, look at the competencies that the National CTSA Consortium has identified for clinical and translational uh, research and leadership in team science. And uh, it's really very exciting to come here with your Clinical and Translational Science Award, and I've forgotten all the specific name of it. We call ours ITHS, and you have some other combination of those letters. But at any rate, um, to, to kind of bring this back together, particularly since there are a number of students in, in the audience as well as faculty and investigators, um, how we come together in doing translational research. So for those of you from the profession of nursing, um, I always like to use this slide because the term translational research is not a new term. In the field of nursing, it has very deep roots way back into the um, uh, early, uh, into the 1960s and 70s when Gene Johnson was talking about translation of research into practice. Uh, then, at least in the nursing profession, we moved to talk about research utilization, using research into practice. Then in all the professions, we've kind of morphed in the uh, 1990s and 2000s in talking about evidence-based practice. We tend to talk about it with whatever our profession is. So we have evidence-based medicine, we have evidence-based management, we have evidence-based nursing, we have evidence-based public health, and so on and so forth. But it's really about evidence-based practice. And now we've come full cycle, and we're talking again about translational research. 
However, it keeps changing the definitions um, and the phases. So it uh, just depends on sort of where you are and what phase you're in. The earliest terms for T1 and T2 in the NIH when the CTSA awards were beginning was uh, the T1 as bench to bedside, reflecting the biomedical roots of a number of that, the lab to the clinical trial. Uh, and then T2, the clinical trials into everyday practice. But because we're academics, we can't be content with something as simple as T1 and T2. So then we uh, started going into at least three phases. And in our CTSA, the, the Institute for Translational Health Science, for a while we were talking about three phases. T1, the phase of discovery, the sort of bench to bedside. And then T2, the development of those ideas, the clinical practice, the development of the trial into uh, everyday practice. And then T3, the implementation phase, the dissemination and, and, and studying of implementation science. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, yes, I, on, when we first started with our, um, I was co-director of the um, uh, education core uh, in our first CTSA. We were not in the very first round. We were in the second round of CTSAs. And so we were looking at pulling together our pre-doctoral programs, which are the, the TL programs, and the uh, early career program, the KL, with this particular framework. So we were looking at a very linear um, progression from basic research, uh, which could be biologic, behavioral, um, epidemiology, um, the, th the things that were helping us understand the sources, the, the etiology of conditions, then taking the basic science into human studies, into trials, so uh, outcomes research, clinical epidemiology, clinical trials, and, and those being the phases of discovery, and then as we were developing the interventions and protocols in the clinical trials, talking about development and then moving into clinical practice and healthcare decisions uh, with the outcome being better health. So that worked pretty well. I think we actually wrote our, our uh, uh, second grant, our, our, we wrote our first grant using that, that scheme. But then we, began to break it apart even further. And I think many, if not most, of the CTSAs kind of use this, this four-phase typology at this point, with T1 still being discovery, the, the basic research uh, into some kind of clinical intervention or clinical description, uh, the development, developing the interventions, the trials, refining the protocols, um, and Sometimes folks use T2 to talk about testing in everyday practice. Uh, other people talk about the testing in everyday practice in T3. But T T3 being the implementation phase and not only diffusing these things into practice but studying the processes by which that happens. And then finally T4, evaluating the actual impact on people's health and the real world applications. Not to be content with that, we added yet another phase at, in the ITHS. So uh, this was our pedal diagram. Uh, and some people really still like the pedal diagram better than the one that we've come to. This piece over here, uh, this comes actually from our, our uh, uh, bioethics group, uh, which was looking at four phases, discovery, development, and so on and so forth. We then decided what we really needed to add was even before the discovery, which was the identification of the problem. Those of you who are graduate students uh, certainly know that well. Um, that, you know, what, what is that? Identify that problem. Uh, and, then, and then what do we know about that problem? So we added a phase of T0, the identification of the problems, the opportunities, the approaches that you might use. T1 still being the discovery phase and the fundamental or groundwork. Notice the morphine of language, which I think is very important, particularly when we're trying to do work across disciplines. We're no longer talking about the basic biologic science or the basic behavioral science, but really the fundamental research uh, in whatever science will, will take this forward. T2 then being the health application to assess the efficacy or the clinical trials. 
but particularly for a number of our colleagues who are in population health, population science, clinical trial doesn't necessarily mean anything. For uh, many of my colleagues in public health, the clinic, they're, they're not talking about the clinic, they're talking about the world. Um, so I think if we use this as the health application to assess efficacy, meaning under the best circumstances possible, that's a broader use of language that can help to encompass a variety of approaches to this. Then T3, uh, this is where we've shifted around a bit uh, in our language. So T3 is the movement into a health practice, uh, the science of implementation and, and evaluation of uh, dissemination, and also the testing of effectiveness. Um, folks in, in particularly in population health tend to use terms efficacy for the, for the very controlled trial. How does this work in the very best possible situation? Effectiveness is how does it work in everyday practice. And that then uh, should move into how do we disseminate this and implement it in everyday practice and how do we understand the barriers and the opportunities. And then finally, T4 being evaluating the impact in a real world population. So what, what we, we like about this is, this is the thinking in circles, if you will. Uh, it's never linear. Sometimes identifying the problems well, let's try this again. Sometimes evaluation of the impact in a real world population leads us back to identifying more problems. Uh, they go both directions and we're often moving back and forth. Um, we've now, we have morphed into our circle or our wheel of translational research. Um, I really like this wheel, not everybody does, but I like this. So this is essentially the same thing you just saw in the pedal diagram, starting with T0 through T4, again with the goal being improving human health. Um, and so it has kind of five nodes. No one investigator is simultaneously working in all five. And I think for those of you who are students, you sometimes may be led to believe that um, in the course of your dissertation, you're gonna you know, do the whole works. Um, we're all working on some component, but this is the value of teams in my view, is that we may be within our teams uh, conducting a clinical trial, but there are, there are pieces of each of these nodes that can happen that are spin-offs and are opportunities for our students and for other colleagues. So um, I think that this just says essentially the same thing that I just showed you on that. Um, the opportunities moving the discovery to a health application, assessing that value for efficacy, moving it into a health practice, testing effectiveness, uh, and then evaluating the real world outcomes. This is an example. Uh, I, it used the, uh, the PETL model because we were working with it at that time. And I'm not gonna read every piece of this, but what it, it does in general, um, folks from the infectious disease um, focus were, the goal was to decrease the morbidity and mortality uh, from TB in people with HIV. And so it was looking specifically at some of the problems that were identified in drug-drug interactions, some of the genetics that's involved in uh, drug resistance, um, clinical trials to try um, a new combination of drugs, uh, to, and then a phase three trial testing the efficacy, then looking at post-drug development and development of the guidelines to use that, and then finally evaluating the uptake of this of treatment guidelines and the effect on morbidity and mortality. So um, it's just one example of the way this wheel can help us look at both the progression of studies in a program of study uh, and the, the various components that can take no matter where you enter it. Um, I'm going to use uh, those, uh, our studies in, in uh, post-stroke morbidity and rehabilitation uh, using the wheel and uh, showing uh, kind of some of the, the, the various components. So basically where we started in terms of the, the identify the problem uh, was the recognition of the relatively high incidence of depression 
in people following stroke. Turns out there's actually a high incidence before you had the stroke, but at that time we were looking at it post-stroke. And, and really what are the predisposing factors um, that, that could help us identify which people are going to have these problems? We moved in uh, because of the knowledge that had already been built as basic groundwork into trying to identify the behavioral mechanisms that might maintain these symptoms and can we do anything in an intervention for that. And I'm going to go in detail on this in a few minutes. Um, and then in the course of that study, we began to ask questions about whether it was related to genotype um, because of some work of one of our investigators. That now is moving into a T2 phase uh, in which we're refining the protocol and testing the effectiveness of two different modes of delivering this intervention that looked like it was fairly effective. Um, so we're asking the question now is whether delivering it by telephone or in person are equally effective and is that related to the person's genetic makeup. We are not at the point yet over on the right hand side of dissemination effectiveness research. Um, if where we are now proves to be an, a, an efficacious mode of helping reduce depression after um, uh, stroke, then the next question is, can that be integrated into everyday care? Can this be part of your, quote, stroke bundle of care that the stroke uh, center and the stroke nurses are able to, to identify who needs it and deliver it um, in, in a cost-effective manner? And what would be uh, the, the uh, barriers as well as the um, facilitators of getting this into everyday practice? And then finally, um, does it matter? Um, does reducing these post-stroke sequelae reduce the burden of illness in the wider population and improve people's quality of life and their recovery? We are actually gathering uh, some uh, investigators from uh, nursing and rehabilitation professions together at the stroke meetings next week to begin to uh, see which of our interventions might be ready to do some effectiveness multicenter trials. So uh, it's taken a number of years, but this is uh, kind of how this wheel works. And then out of this, we're going to identify a whole new set of problems in the next generation. We'll start that over again. So this is the illustration of, 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 a, of a, uh, what started out as a multidisciplinary, and I now I think has become a very interdisciplinary team, um, testing a brief psychosocial behavioral inter intervention delivered alongside antidepressants. Uh, it does uh, reduce post-stroke depression significantly more than usual care. Um, and uh, so I'm going to tell you about the, what we're calling the living well with stroke uh, randomized clinical trial. Uh, I think that this is probably not news to anyone in this room, uh, but depression is a major problem. It's the leading global cause of years lived with disability, regardless whether it's associated with an acute uh, illness such as stroke or um, myocardial infarction. It, it, there's a reduction in the person's uh, productive life. Uh, it looks like, at least for stroke and possibly for MI, that being depressed makes you much more likely to have that first stroke or MI in the first place, and then it reduces the rehabilitation potential afterward. We are continuing to increase in the number of new and recurrent strokes every year. Stroke is now the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. as opposed to the third leading cause of U.S. It's about the third worldwide, and as the population increases, the number of new and recurrent strokes also occurs. It's a lead, it is the leading cause of long-term serious disability. Um, most people do survive uh, an ischemic stroke, uh, but they survive with disability. Uh, blacks more than whites in the U.S. at least, uh, women more than men, uh, and then to have depression on top of it then becomes doubly disabling. There, uh, there are a number of studies trying to look at what the frequency, the incidence in, in prevalence of depro depression after stroke, and it looks like it's around 30 to 35 percent when a number of studies are put together. That is much higher 
than the incidence uh, of depression in people age matched in general, which, which can run 5 to 10 percent in the general population. It's about the same in people with, with a heart attack, with people with diabetes, in people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. There are a whole lot of chronic diseases in which depression is a prominent factor for a roughly a third of the people who suffer from this. Um, all these other pieces are just the, the methodology of it all, but, but the, fact, the fact is that this is, is common in people with chronic diseases that have acute exacerbations like stroke and MI. Uh, but it also says two-thirds of people with these don't have depression. So that, that raises an interesting question. What is it that helps, helps to predict this? Uh, the consequences in, uh, after having stroke poor rehabilitation outcomes uh, that are, are not related specifically to the motor problems the person has, but just don't seem to do as well in rehabilitation, a reduced quality of life for the person with the stroke and others who are caring for them and are close to them. Um, it's the, the evidence is getting stronger and stronger that being depressed following the first stroke increases your chances of having a second stroke or more. Uh, and there is growing evidence that it may be an important risk factor for the, for the first stroke. So I'm going to show you a really messy slide. Um, the point being down here uh, in, in the overall stroke, this is the, the risk of stroke, of, of an initial stroke in people who have a diagnosed depression. And this is increased risk. This side is decreased risk. There's only uh, two studies that were relatively small that show a decreased risk. Overall, when you pull these studies, there's about one and a half times greater chance of having uh, a stroke if you're already depressed. And the few studies, we, we don't actually collect the population statistics in the U.S. that allows us to estimate this, but in Scandinavian countries where they do, it looks like uh, depression following uh, or concomitant with the first stroke uh, also predicts subsequent strokes at about uh, one to two times as much. So it's a big risk factor. Now, can we do anything about it? How does it happen? Uh, there are several theories, uh, one being biological, that the tissue injury of a stroke affects areas of the brain that are important in mood and lead to the depressed mood. Uh, there are theories that there is a disruption in serotonin signaling. Serotonin is important in mood in the brain and, uh, and in creating dopamine and such. Uh, it could be that there's, a, uh, there's a, an increased incidence of depression in chronic inflammation, probably related to cytokines. So perhaps chronic inflammation in both uh, heart disease and in stroke may be a factor. However, the fact that this occurs more commonly in people with COPD in people with MI and such who have not had a problem in the brain suggests that there um, certainly tissue injury isn't the major factor, but perhaps some of these are important. There have always been psychological theories. Stro stroke is a stressor. This is, quote, reactive. Uh, you've had a stroke, who wouldn't be depressed? Well, 66 percent of people who've had a stroke aren't. So uh, this, it isn't totally a reactive kind of a thing, or most likely, it is a combination, all of the above, a biopsychosocial um, uh, explanation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I uh, tell you more about uh, the, the findings of our study. Uh, this slide is not intended to be a depiction of the brain, but it's, uh, it's from a treatment of, um, I, d I never know what to call regular depression these days, <laughs> depression that's not associated with a, with a chronic disease. Um, there have been some studies uh, of uh, drug th uh, where drug therapy is, seems to be reacting in the brain and where talking therapy or the psychological ones are co cognitive behavioral therapy. So uh, these, the blue are people who had only the drugs, people who had only CBT, and then the red is where there's a combination. And this would suggest that there are different areas of the brain that respond to different components of therapies. So that the, the what we call the um, limbic system or the 
more vegetative system responds very well to drugs. That the um, uh, more cortical um, uh, reflective components of, of brain function respond well to the cognitive behavioral therapy or the talking therapies. And when there's a combination, then we recruit in other parts of the brain. All of that suggests that the biopsychosocial, at least to me, may be the best explanations because we have different parts of our brain that are responsive to different kinds of therapies. So how do we know that somebody is depressed? It's very simple. We ask them. Um, and uh, there's, there's a very simple screening question that it, uh, is often used or can often be used in outpatient therapy or with people who've who have had a stroke or an MI, and it's basically, do you often feel sad or depressed? And uh, indeed, that is almost as good as a screener as going through these big, long questions. There's also the uh, patient health questionnaire, the two items over the last two weeks. How often have you been bothered by feeling little interest or pleasure in doing things or feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? Uh, and then the second part of the question is, does this happen never? several days, more than half of the days, or nearly every day. And again, that's, that uh, has a pretty high correlation with the much more complicated ones. So we basically ask people, what we do in our study uh, to identify people that um, uh, might be interested in being screened for the study is to basically say, uh, uh, do you often feel sad or blue? We tend not to use the term depression. Uh, the uh, older people in our study uh, don't like the term depression. They're very happy to tell you that they're feeling down, blue, sad, but depressed carries a stigma in our, in our uh, society, so we kind of move into that. Uh, there are formal screening tools, and we use some of these. One that's really good with people with um, uh, physical illness is the geriatric depression scale, not because it's geared to the older people, but because it focuses on the items that are uh, representative of depression that uh, are not so much affected by your physical ability. So for example, um, are you not moving around much? Well, you may not be moving around much because you've just had a stroke and you can't. Um, so it takes those kinds of things out. The patient health questionnaire, which has nine items, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. Some people use the Beck Depression Inventory. It's longer, and it has a lot more physical items. So we, t we use the... Um, uh, geriatric depression scale, but if I were to do the study again, I'd use the PHQ-9. The criteria for depression in the Diagnostic and Statistical, statistical Manual um, have a whole set, five or more of ten symptoms that have to do with eating, sleeping, and mood uh, in particular. Uh, the key one is uh, having a depressed mood or what's called anhedonia. Um, more than half the days, most of the time in the last couple of weeks. And, and that one is picked up in all of these questionnaires. Then there are other components such as changes in appetite, eating more, eating less, sleeping more, sleeping less, uh, the so-called vegetative signs, um, and if the person has been having thoughts of killing themselves. Uh, always uh, it counts as something in here. Um, and I'm going to actually move on here. So how, how, has, uh, how do we treat depression? Uh, antidepressants certainly have been around for a very long time. Um, and, and the, the uh, Cochrane evaluations certainly um, show, it, particularly, in, and this is particular to stroke, um, the tricyclic antidepressants are very effective, but they have big cardiovascular effects, so people tend not, not to use them because of those cardiovascular side effects. And then the serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, things like Prozac um, and those kinds of drugs are commonly used and are helpful. At the time that these um, uh, Cochrane collaboration reviews were done, the non-pharmacologic therapies, the talking therapies, did, were very, very mixed. But uh, there have been, since that time, including our study, um, a number of therapies of either cognitive behavioral therapy or problem-solving therapy or some kind of psych psychosocial 
talking therapy combined with pharmacotherapy have been shown to be very helpful, and that's what we did in our study. So uh, the, the, um, ours was published in 2009. Uh, the study from uh, Indiana uh, was published in 2007 in, at the VA in which they used a case management approach that included uh, some talking therapy, and then motivational interviewing, which is another variant, which actually seemed helpful in preventing um, uh, depression following stroke. So what, what we did then, uh, buoyed by that notion that maybe a combination of psychosocial therapy and antidepressants could be helpful in reducing depression after stroke, we uh, started uh, going to the hospitals in our area and uh, uh, ha have the nurses and uh, therapists helped identify people who appeared to them to be sad, uh, and which we asked if they would be interested in participating in our study. So we followed over 1,000 people. Uh, 297 of them uh, agreed to be screened for this study. Uh, many of the other 1,000 either weren't eligible um, or um, well, they weren't, they weren't eligible, didn't have a defined stroke and so forth. So 297 were screened by this geriatric depression scale. Of those, 148 uh, had a score which indicated uh, uh, clinical depression. Uh, and we then um, uh, randomized 101. 35 who were eligible did not want to be in the study, uh, and uh, 12 were excluded for a variety of reasons, um, uh, including their medical condition. This is really different from a lot of, say, drug studies, where uh, people, uh, you know, take, they, they hope they'll get into the active arm with this new drug being tested. In our study, uh, the people who refused, refused because they didn't want to, if in the chance that they would be in the active arm, they didn't want to do that because it meant nine weeks worth of working with a therapist, and they were depressed enough. They just didn't feel like they wanted to do that. So it's very different from drug studies where you hope you will get in the intervention arm. In ours, they hoped they wouldn't if they didn't want or, or, or did not um, join the study. So we had 101 people. 48 were randomized to have the psychosocial intervention plus the antidepressant and 53 to the antidepressant. We randomized them uh, with an algorithm based on other factors other than this treatment that could explain better or worse outcomes, age, uh, the severity of the stroke, the severity of the depression, and gender. So we then, um, at uh, nine weeks right after the treatment, uh, at one year, which was our primary endpoint, and at two years, evaluated their mood and their, uh, their functional recovery. So both groups received an antidepressant prescribed by their provider, or at least they were supposed to have. Uh, not everybody actually did have an antidepressant. They all got materials from the American Stroke Association about mood and depression uh, after stroke. Um, they all kept a medication log the first eight weeks. That's how we know that some people actually didn't have antidepressants. Um, and then we followed them up, up, up to two years. We, the follow-up, the major assessment was the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, which is the, uh, the severity of the depression, the Stroke Impact Scale, which is their own self-assessment of how recovered they are and their function in a variety of areas. If they had a caregiver who participated, uh, there was a scale about the burden on the caregiver and then a, a motor index. So, again, you have a lot of students here, and everybody's after you to do something on the conceptual framework. So here's our conceptual framework. Um, so the, the notion is uh, that the post, the, the depression following the stroke uh, is a function of some of their pre-illness personal and psychosocial characteristics. For example, having been depressed in the past is a really big predictor of being depressed. Uh, as we found, there were some genetic components to that. Um, the pathological factors, how impaired the person was initially, uh, and then uh, the person's perceived social and emotional support. All of these pieces came from what was already known about the factors that, that relate to post-stroke depression. We then intervened 
on the, the depression with both antidepressants and, uh, and in the case of the active arm, the um, psychosocial intervention, and we expected that we would affect the morbidity outcomes, their, their degree of recovery, the functional outcomes expressed in the World Health Organization's model of limits in ability, the impact of stroke on their lives, and in social outcomes, their ability, their limits in participation in uh, uh, work, if they were able to return to work, or in other social activities. So, um, I think there was supposed to be another slide here, but we'll, so I'll tell you what the intervention was about, and then we'll come back to how we measured that. So this, this was an example, actually, of bringing together uh, some work from multiple disciplines. Dr. Linda Terry, who's a clinical psychologist, had been doing work for a number of years with people with Alzheimer's disease who are still living in the community. Uh, and who were depressed. And uh, people thought initially when she did her work you couldn't measure depression in people with Alzheimer's disease. And of course you can because they are, uh, particularly when they're still living in the community, were aware of their mood and, um, and, and of these various uh, symptoms. So they had developed uh, what she calls the Seattle Protocols, which was a, a, a series of sessions with people uh, using a problem solving mode and also uh, what's called the Pleasant Events Protocols, helping people to find things, uh, identify things that were pleasurable for them in the past, and uh, identify some new things that can be pleasurable for them. Um, the treatment, it, it's, and then it, embedded in this is this notion that the symptoms of depression are something that you can observe in yourself or in your partner if you're the, uh, the uh, uh, significant other. Uh, that these behaviors are modifiable. Uh, feeling sad may not be modifiable in the beginning, but acting sad can be modified. It's almost like if I whistle, uh, then I'm not afraid. So that you can change the behaviors and that the interactions with other people in the environment maintain these, these uh, interactions. So this is all embedded in the sessions that people have. The goal is to increase the level of pleasant events, pleasant social and other interactions, and physical activity to the extent that's possible at, to improve the mood. And then the person is taught some behavioral strategies that can change this over time. Um, and um, the notion is that the SSRIs, the serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, will improve the mood within a few weeks, but that this behavioral treatment sustains those changes. And I'm pleased to tell you, as you will see here, that worked really rather nicely. So they had developed a whole protocol that we then adapted, and the only thing we changed in the protocol, in the booklet that the uh, participant gets, in the booklet that the therapist gets, is change the word memory problems to stroke. And otherwise, it worked, it, it, there were very little changes in this. So she brought our group together in developing this intervention that then was delivered by psychosocial uh, nurse practitioners uh, developed from a clinical psychologist with a, with a psychiatrist and, and ultimately a geneticist and stroke nurses who were all participating in this project. So it, it, uh, this, at the, this time it was nine, um, nine sessions over eight weeks. So the first week the, the uh, stroke survivor and their partner, if they wanted to, if they wanted to participate, I uh, had two sessions. One is just an introduction to what this behavior therapy is about, and um, identifying things that were pleasant events for them. Uh, then, at the second session, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Then, at the second session, they they talked about scheduling some pleasant events, and it's it's really changing from seeing the glass as half empty to the glass as half full, instead of I can't do this because I've had my stroke. What can you do that's pleasant for you? Um, third week, scheduling pleasant events, identifying a problem that you want to work on, and it usually was a problem related to the stroke. Um, in the fourth week, if there was a caregiver with the person, then we talked about uh, strategies for the caregiver in both supporting the participant, but also in taking care of themselves because there's often a higher incidence of depression in the caregivers of people with chronic illness. 
Notice we didn't start talking about depression at all until the fifth week. And then we talk about uh, what are the behaviors characteristic of it, how can you manage those behaviors. Uh, this is where it brings in a little cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, the thought stopping when it's, this is just hopeless, I'm never going to be able to relearn this again. Uh, stopping that thought and saying, what can I do? And moving forward. Uh, managing the negative thoughts. And then by week seven, generalizing these skills so that you can carry it forward um, into the future. And then week eight was, was consolidating it. We didn't know at the time when we started if people would need a booster for this. Uh, you know, is, is this something that works very nicely for these eight weeks and then, and then it uh, goes to pot thereafter? It didn't, which was very exciting. Yeah, so now we get to the measurements. Um, so we had a whole lot of measurements to give us a sense of what these individual characteristics are of people, including the genetic polymorphisms. There had been some work coming out in the literature suggesting that the serotonin transporter gene is very important in, uh, in mood and in response to treatment. And so uh, we, were, we started to measure uh, the, the, this gene and its alleles as, as one of the characteristics that may uh, alter the uh, likelihood of, of getting depressed in the first place. We measured social support. Uh, we had a lot of things from the hospital, from CT scans about where the lesion was, um, how severe the stroke was from the NIH stroke scale, and so on and so forth. And then as a measure of the treatment integrity, uh, people had homework to do. Did they actually do it? Did they take their meds? Uh, how many sessions did they attend? And, and changes in, the, in pleasant um, events. Uh, then for outcomes, we again measured the uh, Hamilton rating scale for the severity of depression, whether or not they had a subsequent stroke. This was not powered. It's not nearly big enough to know uh, if there was a subsequent stroke, if it was uh, related to this first one, but we measured it anyway in any new comorbidities. Um, the functional abilities uh, were measured by the stroke impact scale. They also had a scale, uh, a Likert type scale, of from zero to 100% back to where you were, where are you now? Um, and then uh, uh, social outcomes, their uh, level of communication, uh, their cognitive work and recreation, and the impact on the partner. So uh, our randomization scheme worked pretty well. Um, we had people uh, uh, who were uh, generally pretty evenly divided between the uh, not evenly divided, but, but uh, all of the personal characteristics were evenly divided between the uh, uh, usual care and the intervention. One area, uh, the, those in the intervention group um, uh, were perceived themselves as somewhat less recovered than those in the usual care, and if you're going to have an imbalance, it's better to have it not in favor of your intervention. Um, so, what happened? Well, for the main outcome, the, uh, the mood, the uh, Hamilton rating scale, um, the control group is in blue, and the intervention group who had, now remember, the control group had antidepressants. 77% of the people in both groups actually took antidepressants. Um, and the intervention group had antidepressants plus the, the talking therapy. So at entry, they were equivalent in their Hamilton rating scale. By the ninth week, the intervention group had markedly decreased the score. Lower is better. Uh, at one year, they were just about the same. And at two years, they were just about the same. And if we look at a score of nine uh, as being indicating remission, um, most of the people in the intervention group were in remission as compared to people in the control group at all time points. However, also notice that the people in the control group did get better over time. So uh, there is natural recovery. I actually, uh, I don't know that we kept track all the way out to two years if they were still taking the antidepressants. Everybody who was taking them was still taking them at this point. Um, but there, is a, there was a natural recovery, but it took twice as long for the people in the control group to get to the same point where the people in the intervention group had been at nine weeks. And the people in the intervention group maintained their gains or their reduction in depression 
out over the um, uh, uh, up to two years period. So that suggested no, we didn't need to do boosters, and yes, there is a uh, there is a stick to itness, if you will. So that kind of supports, at least in my mind, the notion that what we were able to help people do in this group was they are, their, the mood improved, if it was going to improve for everybody in both groups. But these folks learned a whole new set of skills for managing uh, the difficulties of life and, and perhaps hadn't had them as well before and they were able to maintain that for a long period of time. This, um, I'm not going to go over that slide. Now this one I know you can't read. The point of this one is that for the people who were in remission, all elements of uh, the quality of life, the stroke-related quality of life, improved significantly over the period of time. If we looked at intervention versus control, uh, they, they were, it was pretty mixed. Um, but if we look at the people who were in remission, they did indeed increase their participation, they increased their work and recreation, their overall stroke impact um, uh, increased. Uh, th they were by, by the time of um, one year, they, they felt themselves about 75 to 80% uh, improved. So there was an effect on quality of life for those who actually got an admission in remission. The um, genetic components uh, were really very interesting. We had two findings from this. One, there uh, we use this is the serotonin transporter uh, gene, which has several uh, flavors, if you will, or polymorphism. Uh, so there are short alleles and long alleles, and we're not going to worry about this one because hardly anybody has it. But for those of us sitting here in the room, most people have uh, the long allele, either one or two of those, but uh, some percentage of us will have the short alleles. The short alleles are associated with uh, increased uh, risk of depression. So we first took people who had been screened but not, uh, who, who had agreed to be screened in our study but had not screened in on the basis of depression, and then the people who did screen in on the basis of depression and looked at their polymorphisms. The people who, who were depressed uh, uh, with the strokes were people who had one or two short alleles. Hardly ever saw that in the, the long alleles were associated with not being depressed. Uh, even more interestingly, and I'll show you that in a minute, this may be a factor in recovery. Um, yeah, so at any rate, so there, this seems to be the genetic uh, uh, predisposition uh, to, to stroke. This was most intriguing. Uh, this is a box plot showing uh, uh, in um, the ones in blue have um, only the long alleles. This was the intervention group with the talking therapy and the control group. They pretty much look alike. People who had one short allele uh, in the uh, intervention group uh, while they were not at the level of remission, that's what this line is again, uh, they were less depressed than the people in the control group. The people who had two short alleles, almost all were in remission. Now, I have to remind you to look at the end, which is tiny. In the control group, the people with two short alleles looked like everybody else did in the control group. This is suggestive to us, and, and the, the, the small n, you just, I mean, that's just a small number of people, but it's very suggestive to us that there may be, uh, the makeup with these two short alleles may be important in, in the recovery as well. And the, the basis for that, uh, if we were to just go out and get a bunch of people on campus and uh, measure their uh, serotonin transporter polymorphisms, uh, and then give them a test about sort of the, their uh, way of viewing life as optimistic or pessimistic. People who view life as pessimistic tend to have the two short alleles, one or two of the short alleles. People who view the life as optimistic tend to have more of the long alleles. What this says to me is that while we may be born in our genes with a propensity to view the glass as half empty or half full, we can learn to do it differently. I think what we did in this uh, uh, intervention 
was to give people who had not learned how to uh, take on life's challenges and find a new way around them, we gave them a set of skills to enable them to manage life's vicissitudes, including uh, the chronic illness. Now, as I say, this was a very small number of people. And so in our next study, we are now, uh, uh, we, have a whole, we have more people, and we are, uh, we are measuring not only this particular uh, uh, gene, but also some others that are related to coping with stress and coping with life's exigencies. But that's really, that's kind of exciting to us. That's one of those things you discover that set off a whole new set of questions and problems. So we were moving back and forth on that wheel. So what we're doing now is um, uh, an effective, uh, uh, we're still in the clinical trial uh, efficacy stage, but we're trying to refine this protocol. So we're comparing uh, a shorter uh, session uh, and comparing get, doing it by telephone and doing it in person. Uh, and then because our statistician really wants us to be clean and pure, uh, we also have a control group who gets only the antidepressant and not the other things. Um, we're adding measures of fatigue because fatigue is a big component of, of uh, post-stroke uh, problems and is certainly a component of depression as well. We're genotyping everybody with serotonin transporter and um, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which seem to interact in how we deal with stress. We're also, because of this fatigue, uh, we're looking at some of the um, uh, genetic factors in, um, in, in chronic inflammation and cytokines uh, to see whether we're exploring with all of that. Um, and so when we get through with this phase, if indeed it is as effective as it was before, and if it's as effective delivering by telephone, we're well staged to be able to take this into everyday clinical practice. If it isn't, then we'll go back to the drawing board and try to figure out what what, um, what happened thereafter. So we've had several publications um, from this um, in, in multiple literatures in, in, the, uh, in, the, in stroke, uh, which is the primary thing, archives of general psychiatry reflecting part of our team, a rehabilitation nursing, uh, uh, doing some comparative work with our colleagues in Korea, um, and then we're moving on to the next one. Um, I've run out of time, haven't I? Just go to one or one thirty. One fifteen. Okay. Well, we'll whip through because because what I want to bring back here is is this business of the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary team science. This is a slide from when the CTSAs first started, talking about interdisciplinary research and the wide range of people that are are involved in it. I uh, I kind of think the NIH. Um, wasn't thinking so much of nurse scientists as nurse uh, research, research nurses and nurses, nurse coordinators, but this is a big group of people who can do many components. Our, our, our team, I think, uh, we started out very much multidisciplinary. We were each doing our own thing, and then occasionally we'd come together. As we've moved through this, um, we are, we're thinking new thoughts, if you will. Uh, we are teaching each other's, our, our languages, and we've developed a whole new set of, of studies that we're doing. So uh, we have a psychiatrist, a behavioral scientist uh, as part of our team. Uh, the two PIs are, are biobehavioral nurse scientists. We have a statistician, uh, the clinical psychologist. We have stroke nurse practitioners, uh, psychosocial nurse practitioners who delivered it, a wide variety of graduate students who have all gone on to uh, graduate and become faculty in other places. Uh, the neurologist, epidemiologist, a neurologist, basic scientist, the psychiatrist, geneticist, um, and um, anyway, it's a big team. And as we come together, we, we are developing spin-offs of uh, the studies that we're doing. I don't know that the symptoms, the, the depression and fatigue, would have been of interest to our neurologist colleagues had they not been part of this study but have it, they, they are set, setting off on a whole new set of studies that they're doing. Um, this, these language still uh, is often different. So multidisciplinary, I think, I think everybody pretty well uses that. I think these little dogs 
illustrate that very well. They're working uh, sequentially and in parallel to get at the food. Hopefully this one will share it with that one. Um, interdisciplinary uh, often can mean uh, that you're working from your disciplinary base, but you're solving a common problem, as these kids are. NIH tends to use that now as transdisciplinary, that you actually are creating a new and shared framework. I'm not going to try to change NIH at all. <laughs> um, but I think that that is harder work in many ways. Um, I think a really good example of transdisciplinary work is in some of the work in smoking cessation, where people from multiple uh, groups have come together and are really creating new frameworks for how, how we might work with that. But at any rate, it's, I think we're seeing that happen in our team. Uh, the CTSA is, is, a, is huge. I don't know how many, how many of you have ever seen this map before? Not too many. So it's a, <laughs> it is on the, on the uh, NIH website. Those in yellow are the uh, funded institutions with CTSAs. Uh, the blues are the states with them. So as you can see, up here along the west coast, we have a large number, and you have quite a few here in Southern California. There aren't many in the mountain states, although we view ourselves uh, in the um, uh, University of Washington CTSA as actually uh, working closely together with these states through the, the uh, Washington, Alaska, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming region of the, the medical schools network. Um, and so we're spreading out there. And then the inner mountain states um, uh, through here are beginning to work together. But they're, you know, we're kind of coastal and a little bit in the Midwest. But it's, it's proving to be a consortium where there's more and more collaboration and bringing together not only across multiple disciplines in a given institution, but then across the nation. One of the things that, um, uh, oh, I'm going to just skip that. The, these are uh, having been part of the education core and then the education consortium. We spent a good bit of time on what are the, the common um, competencies that people need in either uh, uh, in their educational programs at whatever level to be able to work together. And this is probably more than you can read at this point, but they are on the website. And there's um, uh, actually a whole separate set for comparative effectiveness research. But the ones that I want to make a point about are the translational teamwork, the leadership and professionals, and the cross-disciplinary training and mentoring. That's the kind of thing that, that uh, the T programs and the K programs have been doing within the CTSAs that you're doing right here, right now, uh, in terms of, of the seminar series. And I think it's, uh, it means uh, we need not only to have those basic research understandings, but the ability to translate back and forth across each other's languages. Um, there's a, there are a number of resources that, through the consortium that are becoming available around collaborative science and team science. This particular one that I'm showing here uh, came from the National Cancer Institute, uh, and it's, sort of, it's called a field guide, and it's just got some things that seem common sense but are terribly important about uh, getting the team together, uh, being able to work through the differences in languages, such as things like clinical, which doesn't mean the same thing to all of us in all disciplines. Um, what counts as real science? Uh, behavioral scientists uh, have different measures from bio, bio, biomedical scientists. Uh, people who are doing interpretive science and um, uh, with, with gathering data about people in terms of their stories and their narratives. For example, in recovery from stroke, not only should we be measuring their um, stroke impact scale, but what is it to live with stroke, and what are those things that um, they found helpful in their recovery? That's a different kind of science. So being able to understand and respect those things together. We have um, uh, nationally, uh, through this consortium, uh, and, and uh, uh, Allison mentioned this, the Nurse Scientist Special Interest Group, where we get together on the telephone um, uh, every month. and. Uh, once or twice a year at national meetings, we'll have a gathering of people who are involved in all of those, C uh, all but five of those CTSAs on the board have uh, schools of nursing or nursing programs. Uh, and so we now have 
200 plus members. And we're working together on some projects and also in working in um, interacting with other leaders in the CTSA so that the nurse scientists as PIs and as leaders are understood as well as the research nurses who serve an important function in research coordination. Um, we have not yet gotten those two groups together uh, to working in the same way, but this is uh, something that came from the NIH um, Center with the clinical nurse scientists, uh, students, the clinical research nurse, the nurse coordinator. So the components that are part of the translational science and that are part of, of the importance of gathering data. You have, I walked through a, a uh, the general clinical research center today and had a sign that said nursing. And there is the place where uh, uh, research nurses and others are gathering data and uh, providing uh, some important research resources. So this is just to give a plug, I think, for the fact that uh, among the m multiple disciplines are the, the nurse scientists and the CTSAs. Uh, we've had symposia. Uh, there have been a number of papers that have, have come out, particularly in the community, uh, uh, the community intervention uh, work, as well as the roles that nurses are, are, are playing. Um, this is the community engaged health research, which came out of some conferences that folks were having. So we're beginning to contribute uh, not only to the disciplinary research, but also to the interdisciplinary research. And with that, I think there might be three seconds left for questions. <laughs> Allison, how do you want to handle this? Oh, it's me. Oh, it is oh. me. Okay. <laughs> I found um, Pam, this was great. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, a, a question that I have is in the non-pharmacologic treatment, I wonder, um, I, it would be interesting to look at even some other things, such as mindfulness-based stress reduction, and look at, because that has shown to, um, how, there are actually distinct changes in the brain that happen. There's an article that came out after eight weeks, and I wonder how that might apply. Yeah. It's just a thought. Now, do I need to repeat the question for the TV? Okay, you can hear it. Okay, good. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent question. My guess is that, you know, there are a lot of flavors of psychosocial therapies. <laughs> and, and the mindfulness, I think, does some of these same kinds of things. Um, uh, I, it would be absolutely fascinating to see what the brain changes were. I had breakfast this morning with Steve Kramer from uh, the School of Medicine here, who was part of our team in the very beginning before he came here, and we were all very excited to uh, do some brain imaging before and after with the areas of the brain that are affected. Well, um, I, I couldn't, couldn't possibly add learning how to be an imager to everything else, so we didn't do that. We went with genetics anyway. But that was exactly the kind of questions we had. Uh, it, it, you know, is it not only that we learn some new skills, but do we make changes in those basic circuits that affect our mood and our behaviors? And I, I don't know the answer to it, but I'd love to see it, yeah. yeah. There was a question way in the back. Someone else had a question. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. My question is about the training uh, program. Um, when you added the T0, which as you suggested, it's the most important thing for PhD students, um, we've had some issues with when to engage PhD students in this whole teamwork, interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. and um, have them take their courses, define the research topic, and then try to collaborate across uh, various. And so some of us want uh, students to advance to candidacy before they start thinking about translational issues. Others prefer that we get them going right away when they enter the program. And we have not resolved this, and I wonder if you can comment on how you've trained so many uh, graduate students through this excellent research topic and how you deal with it under your uh, CTSA. 
Thank Perfect you. question. Um, it, it is the age-old question both in interprofessional education for clinical practice and interdisciplinary education for uh, translational research, and I don't think anybody has the answer to it. Um, what we have done in, um, I'm personally a believer in getting people together as early as possible so uh, before they get totally contaminated with the biases of their own discipline. Uh, but uh, what we've done in our um, education groups, I, I think we've been most successful in the uh, TL1 program, which is the, the uh, pre-doctoral. So um, we're not trying to get each of those students who's in the program to be uh, necessarily uh, working in the research program of each other. Um, but what we ha do is bring them together. They have, they have their mentor team uh, from their own PhD program. We bring them together in seminars um, every other week and they present their work and then their mentors come in and talk about some of their work. What that, ha what that forces them to do in presenting their work is to be able to talk about their particular focus on science in language that their mother could understand, <laughs> you know, fully understandable. We, uh, the, uh, the first year we had uh, a medical student who was doing some work with um, uh, spiral CTs and imaging vortices in the beating heart uh, in vascular disease. And then we had a student from social work who was using photo voice as a method to get the experience of uh, Native American youth uh, in, um, in a community um, uh, in a com community change project. They had to be able to talk to each other, and they did, and it was really very exciting. So that's the, the method that we've used there. Uh, with the uh, KL folks who are early faculty, uh, we require them to have a mentor team that is across disciplines and they meet with that mentor team. They sometimes start doing projects with the mentor team. So they learn some new skills. Uh, the, one, one of um, the faculty in, in my school uh, had, in her PhD program, had been doing uh, mouse work with head injury. Uh, and then uh, she came to do a postdoc to learn to do some clinical research. And in her mentor team in the K, she began using databases, uh, head injury databases, and has now morphed into working with some of the, uh, understanding some of the issues of aging and head injury recovery. So she learned some, she worked with the injury prevention group who used databases. She learned to do that. Uh, she brought the skills that she had in lab work into that. So that, that's another good method. And then the thing we're doing now, actually one, one of the sadnesses about becoming dean is that I no longer uh, am as active in the ITHS because I'm supposed to be on the internal advisory group. Uh, but uh, as, as I left the active work, we were uh, starting to bring in people to do some work with the K group and the T group around team science and, and really getting more fundamentally deep into, uh, as our uh, consultant uses, the epistemology of it all. So understanding each other's languages. Uh, and actually, the um, this is a group from the University of Idaho, and they've done some work, I think it was here at Irvine, uh, with, with clinical folks uh, to understand what the language and the values are of clinical and translational research. Anyway, it's, it's, those are several approaches that, that can be used, and uh, then we're trying to do that with, um, we've got sort of a big continuing education program for people who are not currently in training, but the old dogs like me learning some new tricks. And, and I think that's where some of the team science um, approaches will, will be helpful. Mitchell, for your uh, talk, we're going to have to bring it to a close at this point. So I want to, again, thank you for coming and giving your talk. And uh, for the rest of you, look forward to our next talk. We'll be getting, sending out emails across campus when, the, when it happens. Thank you for coming. Thank you.